If beautiful gardens are music to your ears, then you're going to love this show based on Music City USA. It's all coming up. Smith. Thanks for joining us. In today's show, we're going to explore music in the garden, and it's going to be centered around that most musical city of all, Nashville, Tennessee. We'll see the grand grounds of Cheekwood during the winter and learn about the importance of structure in the garden. Plus, find out how this Nashville estate's history has direct ties to a certain coffee that is, shall we say, good to the last drop. And we'll visit a private garden that uses good garden principles and is full of colorful flowers you're sure not to forget. And while we're on this note, musical note that is, we'll visit a California shop for a look at wind chimes. I'll also show you how I help my garden sing with the sounds of nature. But first, let's head into a quick break. And when we come back, we'll meet in Nashville for a tour of Cheekwood. You don't want to miss it. Okay, whether you're a coffee drinker or not, I'm sure you've heard of Maxwell House. Well, believe it or not, this coffee has a direct relationship to one of Nashville's premier gardens, Cheekwood. The story goes like this. During the early days of Nashville, one of its entrepreneurial families founded a grocery. You see, the Cheek family was doing pretty well when one of their relatives developed a superior blend of coffee that the Cheek family invested in. And since this coffee was marketed through the best hotel in town, the Maxwell House, the Java took its name from the establishment. In the late 1920s, the company that is now General Foods purchased Maxwell House coffee for more than $40 million. Now with their finances in order, the Cheeks set about building a beautiful limestone mansion and extensive formal gardens inspired by the grand English houses of the 18th century. Now, during a winter visit to the grounds, we learned about the importance of structure and framework in the garden. We're proud of our gardens all year long. Of course, there's uh, seasons which are, might be more colorful than other seasons, but I think one of the interesting things about botanical gardens is that it showcases the hardscape features in the winter months or in the fall or the spring or the, or the well, really throughout the entire year. The uh, hub of the gardens probably would be the gardens right around the original home that were built back in the 30s, which are the boxwood gardens. Incorporated in that um, is a certain charm that has a certain mystery that allows our guests to, to move from one space to the next. More intimate spaces, personal spaces, closed spaces and open spaces, uh, from the very formal reflecting pool and statuary to a grotto area, to um, enclosed spaces that move our guests from um, perhaps an open um, area to a more uh, darker, more personal space as they're going from sun to shady locations and also the plant material changes at the same time. The boxwoods really were uh, the love of Mr. Cheek. Um, what he did is he traveled around Middle Tennessee and as he found wonderful specimens of boxwoods, he would trade um, wrought iron gates, wrought iron fences for those boxwoods and actually move those boxwoods um, from all over the uh, surrounding uh, community uh, to this property back in 1930, 1931, and 32. So when they moved in in 1932, um, the gardens had a sense of history and age and uh, beauty that they really enjoyed. We want to not only showcase uh, what the cheek gardens were about, but also we want to make sure the collection of boxwoods um, are fun for our guests to see and also enjoy. Now if you'll recall, Bob mentioned that Mr. Cheek collected boxwood from around Middle Tennessee and then transplanted them to Cheekwood. This raises a question, when is the best time to plant shrubs? If you had plans to plant shrubs in your garden last spring but didn't get around to it, don't worry. The fall is one of the best times to get them in the ground. This is because with cooler temperatures and shorter days, the plant is going dormant. There'll be much less activity with the upper part of the plant, but there's still plenty going on with the roots. 
by planting them now, the plant has plenty of opportunity to establish itself and settle in before it flushes with growth in the spring. Now there are several things you can do to help them along. You want to encourage all of these roots to spread out and take hold in their new home. One of the best ways to do this if the plant is in the least bit root bound is to gently tear the roots like this before planting. Once you get the shrub in the ground, add a root stimulator that contains vitamin B1 to the water and then water it in. You see, this root stimulator helps to accelerate the development of feeder roots. Many of these root stimulators contain a mild fertilizer, which is fine for this time of year. Wait and do your heavy feeding in the spring. You'll also want to tuck them in with some mulch. Three to four inches will help keep the roots consistently moist and also help them withstand extreme changes in temperature. This time of year, there are plenty of opportunities to help give your plants a jump on spring. So don't put those gardening tools away just because it's fall. Here are a few tips for protecting your trees and shrubs from ice and snow. Start by mulching your flower beds. You might be surprised how much protection a layer of mulch will provide your plants over the winter. Use bark, straw, pine needles, or leaves. I even use my old Christmas tree and garland. In my vegetable garden, I like using frost blankets like these to protect young plants. You can also keep winter vegetables growing longer by using a movable cold frame. To keep my tree roses from being damaged, I protect them from extreme temperatures by wrapping them with burlap cloth. Shrubs and trees can be some of the most expensive investments in our gardens. So let's take a look at some ways to keep ice and snow from damaging them. I've learned that tying up certain hedges and large shrubs, like this boxwood, can keep the snow from weighting down the plant's limbs. And knocking the snow off trees and shrubbery is a good idea. It will keep plants from bending and breaking. But don't try to knock the ice off your plants. Let the ice naturally melt to avoid damaging limbs and foliage. These are just a few suggestions that you can put to use that will take the worry out of winter. Don't forget, we still have another Music City garden to look at right after the break, so don't go away. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. In today's show, we're focused on Music City USA and harmony in the garden. Now, I live in an urban environment, so how do I create harmony with the sounds of the city constantly occurring? Well, one way is to create a secluded enclave, such as my fountain garden. You see, I've used tall holly hedges to help block out the sights and the sounds that are a part of my neighborhood. And water plays a very important role in creating a natural ambience. You see, I try to incorporate water into all of my garden designs, whether it's a small wall fountain or an elaborate pond or water feature. Now, another way to create natural sound buffers in your garden is to make your garden a more inviting place for birds. I do this by feeding them throughout the year, especially in the winter months when food sources are scarce. As gardeners, there's so many plants that we can grow that are inviting to birds, like berry-producing shrubs. And there are also so many different types of bird feeders available. Just take a trip to a local pet supply store or nursery. It can be very informative. You'll find that there are just about as many different types of seed as there are birds. Now, there are other ways to block urban noise. For some, it's music to their ears, and for others, well, they might consider it fighting fire with fire, and that, of course, is using wind chimes. I think that's a lovely sound and could have a place in the garden. To get a better idea about wind chimes for gardens, I recently had an opportunity to visit with Robin Stockwell, owner of one of the largest wind chime shops in the country at Succulent Gardens. These are beautiful instruments that hang in the air and the wind plays them. There's such a wide range of sounds, tones, deep, high, beautiful sounds. The latest thing in wind chimes are tuned wind chimes. If you look at the wind catcher on this wind chime and tells you what notes that this wind chime is playing, each tube is tuned to a certain note. This particular wind chime is called a Himalayan echo. If you buy a Himalayan echo today or tomorrow, and play it, you're going to get the identical sound from the two wind chimes. What really makes the difference in these wind chimes is the sizes of the tubes. Small tubes tend to make a higher sound. Bigger tubes get a little bit deeper. And then when you go to a real big tube, you get a big sound. So you can't get that big sound out of a little tube. It's impossible. 
No matter what size or variety you choose, wind chimes can create a symphony of sound for both you and the plants in your garden to enjoy. If you find that your wind chime makes a little too much music and you want to put it on mute, Robin suggests that you take the knocker, this little piece that hits the tubes, just place it on top and that'll quieten it down. Today's question comes from Judith in Florida. Judith writes, we just bought a new home and I'm really getting into container gardening. Do you recommend a particular kind of soil? Well, Judith, what you want to keep in mind with soil is to start with new soil each year in containers from one season to the next. And I like to use a container soil that's blended for container gardening. By starting with fresh soil each year, you can avoid pathogens that might be carried from one season to the next. You see, you want a soil that will retain moisture, but at the same time, leave those all important air pockets for the roots. I also recommend that you wash your containers out at the beginning of each season with bleach water. This will kill any disease that last year's plants may have left behind. Also, when you pot up your container, throw in a little water retentive polymer for good measure. You see, some potting soils come with this already included, but for those that don't, it's as simple as sprinkling in these little granules that look like rock salt. When they're wet, they can double, even triple in size, allowing the plant to pull moisture from the polymer and keeping the container consistently moist for a much longer period of time. More great container tips can be found on my website, pallensmith.com. I've even got a free weekly newsletter that you can sign up for where we answer timely viewer questions just like this one. Okay, when we come back, I'll show you a recipe using a favorite southern fruit. Stay with us. When I was a kid, one of the things about summer that always got my attention was watermelon. Whether we ate them directly out of my grandfather's field or chilled at a picnic, the flavor was always a big treat. Because of my fondness for the melon, and since they're so plentiful this time of year, Paige and I thought we would take one of these guys and make something to help beat the heat. Yeah, we're going to make a watermelon slush. Now making our watermelon slush all started with a trip to the farmer's market where Paige chose just the right melon. We start by splitting a nice ripe melon and scooping out all of that sweet, juicy fruit from the rind. Paige has been a big help in getting everything ready, and now she's busy removing all of these seeds. Now this recipe only requires four cups of fresh watermelon. We're going to save all of the extra in the refrigerator for more slushes later. You'll need a blender and about three cups of ice. Crush the ice and then add the pieces of watermelon. Blend a little longer until slushy. Next, add four tablespoons of honey or sugar and the juice of a lemon for a little extra zip. Blend all of this for about 10 seconds more and it's ready to enjoy. Of course, anytime children help in the kitchen, they should always be supervised. This is such a simple and nutritious drink. It's easy to make and it's a great way to enjoy one of summer's greatest flavors, watermelon. Right, Paige? Yeah. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed our time together as much as I have. We've certainly seen a lot of beautiful places in Nashville. And we got some ideas on how to bring nature a little closer to us. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile